saying, well, what are you talking about? Forecasting doesn't matter. The goal of forecasting is to make money. We pay them to find patterns and they find patterns, even when the patterns don't actually exist. You end up being right for the wrong reason. Though. Exactly. Debating one or 2% at a horizon of seven or eight months on a skew is crazy because it requires a crazy measure to, to substantiate a crazy process. You know that is the product of them not wanting to know how bad the forecast process is. Welcome to Locan TV. I'm your host, Connor. Today I'm joined by Joannes Vemorel, co-founder of Locad. We have a special guest today, Jonathan Corelts. Amongst other things, he's the CEO and co-founder of Northfind uh, Management. He's a published researcher in the field of unconscious bias, and he's written this lovely book, Histories of the Future. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Right, Jonathan, I hope you're ready for a sea of uh, flattery, because I actually read the book. I really enjoyed it. I think I might, in fact, be your target audience because uh, I'm literate, but also uh, I don't have, a, <laughs> I have an interest in these topics, you know, economics, business, uh, behavioral economics, but I actually don't have that formal training. My background, as we discussed before, is uh, music and philosophy. So I actually learned quite a bit going through the history of forecasting. You have a very nice, uh, very nice tone, very uh, accessible and readable, so uh, thank you very much. So, uh, we'll start at the beginning, I guess. What exactly was the inspiration for writing a book on the last hundred years of forecasting? Well, my approach to forecasting and practice um, has always been understanding what's going to make a business impact. Uh, and, and, and that might seem obvious, um, but in a lot of organizations, forecasting is, is a thing that's done because it's, quote, supposed to. And... Um, not necessarily a lot of thought is given to why we're forecasting. And, and as a result, a lot of received wisdoms get passed down from generation to generation in the business. And people just go through the rote process of, quote, forecasting like they're supposed to without really understanding what are the elements of, of the process that are impacting the business positively? Are there things we could do to improve it? Um, and, and most importantly, why? And the why question is is something that I guess maybe I wouldn't call myself a contrarian per se, but I think it's always good to have a, a little bit of healthy cynicism um, or skepticism. Um, and, and I've often asked why. And, and a book that really resonated with me when I was uh, an economics student was written by Bruno Latour. And he's from that Latour family. Uh, he's the essentially the black sheep of the family because he's the one not making wine. But Bruno Latour has a PhD in epistemology from uh, L'Ecole des Mines, um, which for those of you familiar with it, you'll know is not a half bad university. He spent a, a lot of time researching the modes of learning and the modes of knowledge. And he wrote a book called Science in Action. And this book, Science in Action, looks at some of the black box foundations of science, things like the, the dual helix structure of DNA. Um, and, and brings them back to before they were facts, before they were black boxed, and helps us understand the historic context in which they were born. And in doing so, he really illustrates that a lot of these scientific certainties are a lot less certain than we think they are. It's convenient to black box them so we can move forward, but it's dangerous to because we, we lose sight of the uncertainties. And that always stuck with me. And when I, after, I guess, a couple of decades of, of forecasting and practice, started thinking about some of the lessons I learned along the way in terms of things I was told versus what was actually happening in real life, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to apply this same sort of lens to forecasting? Let's look at, you know, basic, basic ideas like where did simple exponential smoothing come from? And why do some people think the alpha has to be 0.1? And where did uh, the idea of uh, consensus forecasting come from? Or indeed, where did the idea of business forecasting at all come from? And maybe in, in understanding the historical context and in understanding some of the people involved, we'll get better in, insights into the validity or um, less certainty in, involved in some of these forecasting principles. So 
I, I will admit there were, there are some of the chapters as I wrote them that I, I had aha moments. I mean, I, I thought I knew, you know, a fair amount about forecasting, but as I researched it and you'll see, I mean, I think there's something like 300 plus uh, citations. Mm -hmm. We went to a lot of, a lot of research. I mean, we, we looked at de declassified um, military memos from the Rand Corporation into the initial research they did into group forecasting and developing the Delphi method. So, I mean, all kinds of really interesting sources. And, and I learned things. Um, but the main thing I learned is what I'd sort of started with, which is I don't think you really lose anything by having a healthy skepticism about everything you're doing, asking why and asking what could we do better. Well, thank you. And before we go any farther, I guess in a sort of Cartesian manner, it would be good to just define exactly what we're talking about. So what is forecasting for you? And that can encapsulate you know, the history. But like right now, when you use the term forecasting, you mean? <laughs> that, that's a great question. Um, and, and that could be a, a, a big question or a little question. And I, I, I imagine but for... Yeah, I imagine for most of your viewers, you'd prefer it to be a little question. Um, and, and I'm not being flippant when I say this, but, but I would say we're, we're taking a guess at what the future looks like. Um, now, it can obviously be more, that guess can become more scientific. It, it can become more guided uh, and, and bounded by things we understand about principles of uncertainty. But at, it, at its essence, we're taking a guess about what's going to happen. And, and I think it's dangerous to lose sight of the fact that ultimately we're guessing because then we can begin to ascribe too much certainty to a process that is based on uncertainty. Well, that's an interesting point. And Joannis, to you, I mean, a, a foundational principle of LOCAD is embracing uncertainty, no? Yes, um, and, but to answer the, the question about, and that's, that's a very interesting, I believe that, you know, there is, there, there is such a thing that I would, classi uh, that I would define as the, the classic forecasting perspective, which is dating back to the very beginning of the 20th century. And that's something I would say popularized by people that you mentioned in your book, such as um, uh, Roger Babson and Irving Fisher. And let's, and if we take it, you know, this, uh, and it has, so the, the sort of component is of forecasting is not independent in the way it was even, uh, I would say, um, approach from a, a formal perspective. It's literally time series. You have measurements performed over time, or measurements of what? Anything, you know, um, uh, amount of steel being produced, number of potatoes being harvested, whatever. You have something that can do a measurement, you can repeat the measurements, you know, every week, every day, every quarter, doesn't matter. So you, what you end up with is a sequence of measurements that you can represent, you're going to call that a time series. And then the obvious thing to do, and I say obvious because it's as soon as you plot your time series, it becomes relatively obvious, is to let's say, say I have a curve, where does it go next? And that's pretty much, I would say, the essence of the classic forecasting perspective. You see, the, the classic that emerged at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and it's, it's literally collecting measures and then extending. And indeed, that's, uh, and I think that's when I say it is only one way to look at it. And, and uh, our guest was actually very prudent on saying the way you anticipate the future, because indeed, um, the one, one thing that is very much, I would say, untold in this classic thing is that, is it really sensical to approach you know, the future by just extending a series of measurements. And that's, that's actually a very, very tricky question. And, uh, they, and they are actually, uh, and that's where I, 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 uh, it's a matter of epistemology and we are going back to those very interesting questions, which is, it's not that is wrong per se, you know, of doing that. It's just that it's, it's a very opinionated way to approach the future. And um, clearly, it has been, it has been uh, very much, I would say, a thing of the 20th century to approach from the very first of, uh, of the 20th century, and then it, it has been progressing through the entire century on this approach, refining the methods, finding new methods, also finding that uh, some fairly elementary methods were not that bad, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So there, are there were plenty of, 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 of back and forth, but within the realm of this paradigm, and I would say probably it's, it's still too soon, you know, the, the, uh, to speak for the world of 
20, of the 21st century, but if I were to, to speak from my own vantage viewpoint, is that probably the, the, this history of the future is not complete. You know, it will keep people, we keep inventing new ways to look at the future. And um, the, the ways that have emerged in the 21st century are in many ways, and we can discuss that later, much stranger. But so, so the, I would say when we define forecasting, I think it's fair to speak of the classic 21st century forecasting perspective, which is very, very much attached to time series and time series forecast. Well, Joannis, on that point about the, the classic approach to forecasting, and I want to throw it back to you, Jonathan, uh, something that I think permeates all of your work, and I don't just mean the book, I mean everything that I've read of yours uh, online, there seems to be um, something of a recalibration of how people measure the success of a forecast, like a classical approach to what makes a forecast successful. And again, I'm a tourist here, but your thesis is that it is not forecast accuracy per se. Could you expand on that a bit, please? I definitely hope we, we follow up the idea of the classical approach versus some of the different philosophies of forecasting that I think are important to, to look at as we move forward. But in the meantime, um, yeah, one of the things, and this goes back to my earliest comments on the show, um, one of the things that, that puzzles me is how, how frequently and how easily people can talk about knowing the forecast will always be wrong, as though this is a, a get out of jail free card. Like, hey, you're asking me to forecast, I'll do my best, the forecast is always wrong, so don't blame me when it is, but then they still calibrate operational strategies and indeed financial strategies on the hope for a highly accurate forecast. So I want to be very clear because I, I, I talked about this at a couple of conferences in Amsterdam last week, and, and I had some very angry people, uh, particularly software vendors, in those sessions saying, well, what are you talking about? Forecasting doesn't matter. And, and, and I want to be clear, forecasting absolutely does matter in, in particular application because there's some places where it doesn't matter from an ROI standpoint. Um, if, if you're a, a, a bespoke clothier and you can make three suits a year and your customers are willing to wait for 10 years, you don't need to spend a ton of time forecasting demand. You're at maximum capacity. The ROI is going to be minimal. For everybody else, there probably is an ROI. But the point is forecast accuracy for me is not the scorecard metric. Forecast accuracy is not the goal. Mm -hmm. Forecast accuracy is a diagnostic metric that we can use to identify root causes of errors and root causes of suboptimalities that we can then use to recalibrate and optimize for continuous improvement. The goal of forecasting is to make money because the goal of business is to make money unless you're in a business that doesn't do that. And forecasting is one of a number of tools that we have at our disposal to do that. And in some cases, wielded properly, it's the best tool we have. In other cases, it's, it's a supportive tool. And in other cases, it probably won't yield a lot of benefit. But it's understanding your business to understand what you should expect of a forecast that I think matters a lot. The forecast is always wrong. And now people use that as a, a jail-free card. I, I really love this, this, this sort of um, this, this expression. Um, the interesting thing is that it wasn't always the prevalent perspective. You know, uh, Roger Babson, uh, was a, an immense fan of the work of Newton, uh, mm -hmm. Sir Isaac Newton, and he even, you know, he, he, and he was, and I think that was very much this sort of um, uh, progressism, you know, I, I, incredible belief in the, the, I would say, the uh, absolute power of science that you would be able to capture things and have some kind of numerical modeling, and just like you can predict down to the last second of arc, the position of, uh, of Mars three centuries from now. They both believe, as I ultimately do, mm -hmm. that math underpins everything. And if we had the capacity and enough data, math could explain everything. But in practice, we're not there yet. And I would say um, that's something that was very much not very much, I would say, understood at this beginning of um, 20th centuries is that we have, there are, there are Entire orders of magnitude of difficulty that are just not there. And so it's not just like the ultimate formula is around the corner. I believe that one of the key discoveries of, of the 21st century is to, to realize for all the things that is like knowledge related, how much, you know, there are, I, I would say, there, we, we can see that there are entire, 
I would say probably entire fields of knowledge that just escape our grasp. And it's not just, I mean, I think we have, in a large extent, given any hope to discover something that would be equivalent to, let's say, um, the, 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 the law of um, gravity, where in just one equation you can explain you know, enormous amount of things, and it's just a one-line equation. That was, I think, that was the sort of thinking that, that did exist at the time uh, of, I mean, uh, again, for the audience, we are talking of um, North American statisticians uh, described in the book that where it was very much something that was that emerged in the in the USA due to the fact that the emergence of a middle class who owned stock options, uh, not stock options, sorry, stocks, mm -hmm. and they wanted to have like uh, to, to have projection about what will give them, you know, the, the best returns. And so they, are, they were very interested in all those sort of forecasts. And thus, it, it was something that really emerged in the USA and in North America. That's, that's very important. The, the cultural component or the geographic, geocultural component is, is key because you've got, it, it wasn't particularly statistically driven in North America. I mean, like you pointed out, Joannis, Babson loved Newton and Babson loved everything Newtonian. And and he took what was, you know, I think we'd have to admit a fairly superficial understanding of, of Newtonian principles and tried to apply it without the benefit of a statistical understanding to forecasting, which is essentially if something goes up for a while, it's going to come down for a while because that's what happens with gravity. Irving Fisher, who earned the first the world's first Ph.D. in economics, um, sorry, uh, North America's first Ph.D. in economics, um, try to apply his mathematical background to what to that point had been a social science. So he starts to marry some of the statistics where you have to say was absolutely being uh, driven in Europe rather than North America to the North American field of economics. But really it's, it's in Europe during that time where we see all of the advances happening in, in, in the math that ultimately forecasting would use. And so th there was this, this kind of, I would say, very deterministic approach. I mean, we said determinism where people would have, you know, this, this thinking that you could have, you could model. And the interesting thing is that it's going to, you know, last for a long time. Uh, I mean, even, you know, science fiction works in the 60s with, for example, the, the series of Isaac Asimov with foundation, the idea that you can literally have a science, psychohistory that can literally predict the future in, in a very, very uh, mechanistic way. Uh, it, it, it lasted for a long time. And, um, and, uh, and yet, that's, that's very interesting because that, that really constitutes this, this classic perspective. And, uh, but also, it, uh, I believe that it kind of um, put in place in organization a certain way to approach the forecast. And due to the fact that people have been operating for decades with fairly inaccurate forecasts, they, f <laughs> they have come to use to, to realize, as you were saying, that yes, the forecast is always wrong. Obviously, our experiments to uh, is telling us that. But they have not, and that's the interesting thing, is that this vision that emerged almost a century ago now, I mean, uh, I mean to some extent, maybe a little more than that, uh, this idea that ultimately it will get right, this thing has, the, the funny thing is that people have not really come to term with the consequence that it will never get right. And that's, that's an interesting thing. So they, have, they, they, they morally accept that, and they don't you know, fire people because the forecast is wrong. So that's okay, but then uh, should we re-challenge in depth to, to, to embrace this aspect of the forecast? Not really. I think what's very interesting, and you've mentioned determinism a couple of times, and I think this is key, a, a lot of the science that was emerging in the 19th and 20th centuries, early 20th centuries globally, not just in North America, was basically born of the the momentum that we started gaining in, in the Renaissance. We came out of the Dark Ages. We started figuring out that by applying scientific principles, we can begin to shine a light into these dark areas of knowledge and really elevate ourselves. And, and, and we started to get, I think, a bit arrogant about the extent to which we could do that. We, we started to believe in the 19th and early 20th centuries that with enough effort, there's really nothing that we can't learn. And... And, and that informs two really important themes in, in forecasting. The first is 
a deterministic approach makes sense with that philosophy because it means if I work hard enough and I'm smart enough, I will get to that accurate conclusion. Rather than accepting that's a fool's errand, I am always going to be wrong, and probabilistic approaches, which incidentally, um, and, and you know this well, Joannes, Komagorov was doing all of his work in statistics around the same time that these early um, deterministic approaches were being born. So it's not like we had to wait another hundred years for the possibility of probabilistic approaches. The math was there. The second piece is that believing that with enough effort and with enough focus, we could figure out anything. It, it brings us to what today is a very hot topic of AI. Now, the idea that AI can solve non-value-added activities, rote activities for, for humans is not new. In fact, I mean, there was a conference in the 1950s at Dartmouth College where a bunch of the early thinkers on AI set out 10 things that they thought AI could accomplish in the next 10 years. <laughs> and, and we haven't done any of them 70 years later. That doesn't stop us from trying. And I think the trying is important. But I think ultimately the lesson is we need to accept that there are ultimate limitations on our capacity for understanding everything. And once we understand that, then we, we become more open to other approaches, like, for instance, probabilistic forecasting, which then sets us up for the reality that we say we know we're always going to be wrong. But now accepting that, let's understand what that looks like in terms of real business outcomes and calibrate our strategies on the knowledge that we will be wrong rather than the hope that we're, we're somehow going to be right. It seems like you've dropped two very interesting pins there, one being essentially a, a precursor to a discussion on behavioral economics. I think you're, you're referencing overconfidence and the second on AI. Yeah, I, I figured yeah, in chapter six, I think five or six. Uh, so we'll take those in turn, if you don't mind. So uh, first to the behavioral economics. I know that that's very much your metier. Could you expand a bit on how behavioral economics actually influences or interacts with forecasting? Sure. So... Uh, Joannes, early on in the conversation, mentioned several times the classical approach to forecasting. And I would say the, the classical approach to forecasting is, is itself sort of a byproduct of the, the classical or more accurately neoclassical economic way of business in general. Um, and, and that is, again, from a very 19th and 18th century viewpoint that if we if we work hard and apply mathematical and, and scientific principles to this, we can understand. And Adam Smith in, in 1776 wrote the seminal work, The Wealth of Nations. And one of his key points is that basically all of commerce can be understood by the basic principle that humans are rational actors who, when given clear value-based choices, will gravitate naturally to the one with the greatest utility. And that doesn't necessarily mean the greatest money, but the one that they have the greatest benefit of some sort from. And intuitively, that feels correct. The problem is, for, for any of the listeners who have studied economics, you'll know, especially econometrics, you'll know that your models never hold up 100%. Uh, and, and they sort of, again, I know Joannis likes this saying, so I'll use it again, the get out of jail free card is, it's not that the model is wrong, it's that the, the actor is irrational. But the problem is, especially um, recently, with, with many examples from COVID-19, one would have to conclude, even without a knowledge of behavioral economics, there's a lot of irrational people out there. We do a lot of crazy things that, that neoclassical models just don't account for. So what Kahneman, uh, who won the Nobel in 2002 for his work, and his collaborator Amos Tversky, uh, who passed away before he was able to, began discovering in the early 70s, and that was added to by the economist Richard Taylor in, in 1982, uh, when they began collaborating with him. What they found was, although certainly in application there are principles of neoclassical economics that hold, that we need to understand in a broader sense how these systems of demand and supply and price setting and ultimately decision making are influenced by unconscious drivers, unconscious psychological drivers, which in some cases are environmental, in some cases are hardwired evolutionarily, but in all cases exist. No, no matter how free from bias one thinks one is, no matter how objective one thinks one is, you are still subject to these unconscious biases that create a lens through which 
you are interpreting data. Actually, sorry, you, you actually said in the book that the average person makes about 30,000 decisions a day. And I mean, we're obviously not conscious of all of those. We couldn't possibly be. No, and this, this, this is the benefit of, of these heuristic processes that we have. I mean, a, a, a lot of times we view heuristics as a pejorative, like it's a shortcut. And when uh, Joanne has mentioned uh, in the 70s and 80s, when some of these more complicated scientific or, or statistical approaches to forecasting began arising, their proponents, like George Box and Gwilym Jenkins, for instance, who many of your listeners will know were co-authors of the ARIMA method, they sort of scorned the simpler methods like simple exponential smoothing or, or, or uh, Holt-Winters triple exponential smoothing as being too simple and being just a heuristic, a shortcut. But what the first four M competitions showed uh, were that in many cases in practice, being a heuristic isn't necessarily bad. And now psychologically, there's a huge benefit to being able to make decisions very quickly. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, if, if I am aware of a tiger in my peripheral vision stalking me in the woods, if I stop and consider all my possibilities and, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about all of the various things the tiger can do and all the various options I can have and then try to weigh the most appropriate one for me, I'm probably eaten by a tiger. And that means I don't procreate and that means my DNA ceases to exist. So over time, we learned that there's a number of heuristic processes that benefit us evolutionarily. One of them is the representativeness heuristic, which is, this looks like something I've seen before. The last time I encountered this and I had a successful outcome, this is the thing I did, I'm going to do that again. So we don't have to teach babies to recoil from things that look like snakes. It's baked in. We don't have to stop and think about what to do when we see a bus coming towards us. We jump back. And the thirty to 30,000 decisions we have to make a day most of them are navigated by some sort of heuristic. If we, if we had to think about all of them objectively, we would be crippled. Um, the downside of heuristics is that the thing that we think looks like something we've seen before doesn't always actually represent that thing. Um, and especially when it comes to interpreting data, we're often subject to something called the cluster illusion bias. So when we're paying people, to interpret data and make a forecast, they feel a need to add value. So we pay them to find patterns and they find patterns, even when the patterns don't actually exist. It's, it's natural that this happens, one can't blame them, but there's, there's a host of biases that impact our ability to rationally and objectively interpret data. Well, actually, Jonathan, on that, on that point, you actually have an example in the book from research that you published elsewhere. You, know, you presented completely sanitized random data to a group of people, asked them to guess, you know, will the line go up, will it go down, will it be static, or, or don't know. Now, I'm not going to try and explain your work. Can you explain that and the significance of that finding? I mean, that, you haven't gotten to the finding, but that, that is indeed the choice framework. So we presented, and this is the spoiler now for anybody who's going to ultimately do our bias assay, a, a lot of the data that is presented is stochastic. Um, and we were given a number of different stochastic data sets, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't inadvertently have trend or seasonality in any of them. So these are as stochastic as it gets. There's, there's no possibility any stat package will find trend or seasonality or any other pattern in these data sets. And yeah, when we, when we present the unedited, unframed data set and ask people, where do we think that the, uh, the demand is going to go? We have a pretty much an even split between up, down and unchanged. And we don't have many people that say they don't know. Um, don't know would be a completely appropriate answer because that would represent the fact that I don't know anything about what this data means. I don't even have the, I don't have the benefit of, of being able to run a stats tool on it to see if there's any trend or seasonality. And by the way, you can't predict the future anyway. That would be the correct answer. Very few people actually say that. We then present this same data set later in the assay with a bunch of other questions in between. But this time it comes accompanied with a little story. Um, the data is the same. The story is all, uh, it, it contains information that at its face might seem useful, 
but in practicality actually has no bearing on the data anyway. And what we find is about 70% of people become more certain of what the decision they're going to take is. So we have anyone who was a, a don't know typically moves out of that camp. And most people that were unchanged move into the either above or below category. Um, it depends how we frame it. If we end up with a positive frame, we see a lot of people gravitate that way. And that's a really important insight from a practical forecasting standpoint, because the data hasn't changed. Um, in the first example, the outcome is probably closest to the most appropriate you could expect from a human. I mean, a computer would have done it immediately, but it, it's the closest we get to an appropriate outcome for a human. But once we accompany that with a story, now suddenly all logic and rationality go out the window and we end up with an extremely biased view of the data. The problem is in practice, it isn't that different. We ask people to create demand plans, but they're doing this within the broader context of an organization which has its own cultural biases, its own business-based biases towards growth, towards ultimately positive outcomes. Um, and it's, it's not really that surprising then that when we measure the effect of human intervention on, on computer-based uh, forecasts, we, we in general most often see positive biases being driven. Um, in some cases, there's even overt pressures to have a positive bias in organizations. Mm -hmm. Pressure to, to forecast to plan, pressure to hit certain goals, and people are basically told to change the forecast. But even, even minus those overt biases, some research by um, Len Tashman and, uh, oh, I'm going to forget their, all of their names, Spiros Makradakis, mm -hmm. um, Paul Goodwin, their, their long-term research shows that we're probably about four times more likely to make positive adjustments to a, a forecast than negative adjustments, which makes no sense. If we start with a statistically driven forecast, the residuals should be falling normally distributed on either side of that forecast. If it required a human adjustment, over time, we should balance out. But because of this unconscious bias where we're much more risk averse than reward affine, and again, there's evolutionary reasons for that, we like to materialize upside possibilities much more than we like to materialize downside risk. And we end up with people's fingerprints all over positive bias in forecasting. Do you find that, Johannes, to be the case when uh, you're doing forecasting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, a decade ago when LOCAD was still doing, I would say, classical forecasting, we started as a, as a, as a software vendor by doing, I would say, classical forecasting. Right now, I would say we have an element of predictive modeling in the toolkit, but the way to operate, we can discuss that. It, it's very, very strange and outside, I would say, um, the context of what would be deemed relevant about the histories of your future, unless you start talking about the history of the future for the 21st century. But back to those experiences, it's very interesting because we had um, very, I, I had very, very similar um, experiences. Notably with our clients, we had a um, series of clients uh, still have in um, retail. And when it came to forecasting promotions, one of the things that we are frequently getting is that the uplift of the promotion is limited. You know, yes, you're going to have, like, let's say, I give you an order of magnitude, uh, uh, an hypermarket. Yeah, maybe you know, it's going to improve, increase by 30%, 50% the sales. That's a lot, but that's very much below the sort of, we are going to do 10x for this product that people were expecting. And the interesting thing was uh, for those promotions, uh, we did a whole series of benchmarks for, with teams uh, of, of actually just, you know, modeling a super, super simplistic uplift for the promotion versus people that were, you know, micro-optimizing, saying, ah, oh, I know exactly this brand of chocolate, etc. Et and and Locad was coming on top in terms of accuracy with, um, <laughs> Uh, I would say ridiculously simple models. You know, uh, the the sort of things that were of the order of the complexity of the exponential smoothing, but just for the uplift of a promotion, which is just a constant factor plus fifty percent, and you're done. And that was actually better, but much better than people that were like micro optimizing. And indeed, the bias was very much in the positive, where they would say, "But you, you realize that this brand." It's the first time in the last 10 years that they are promoted, they are going to do 10x. And we're thinking, <laughs> yeah, probably not. It's probably going to be like 
plus 50%. I know that you're going to be disappointed. Uh, but, but then you end up with super weird things where, for example, you have a forecast that is completely nonsensical. Like you, you say you do 10x, and you don't do 10x, but purchasing 10x is actually the good move because you, the, the, the provider, the supplier, actually gives you a mass, uh, to the retailer, a massive discount. So basically, it's kind of a speculation on the value of the inventory. And if your supplier gives you like a 25% discount, and you just accumulate, uh, you know, three months worth of stock at a massive discount that you will sell over time, it could turn out to be a, a smart decision. But you see, that was, that was something that was very bizarre in terms of thinking that was, I'm going to start by making a very nonsensical forecast, like I used to, and then due to the fact that Usually with promotions, I'm buying the stock with a vast discount from the supplier as a way for me to be able to put a big discount on the tag price of the stuff. I end up doing a good operation over time. Uh, but, but you see, the, the deconstruction, it's, um, there is an element of rationality. Uh, but so you're, you're, you're being, it, you end up being right for the wrong reason. Though. Exactly. So and that's, so that's very interesting. You know, that's the sort of things where... Um, it's not, you know, and again, the fact that people may be irrational doesn't mean that you can't apply reason on top of that to model yes, this irrationality. Absolutely. You know, it, it's irrational, but it's not. And that's why also I would say, you know, if I bump on your comments, I say, um, I, my own perspective would say, would be there is no limit to the human ingenuity. You know, a priori, that's my, I would say, uh, that's a belief. That, that's not, you know, an element of science. Uh, my core belief is that there is no limit to the amount of human ingenuity. But make no mistake, some stuff to be addressed requires, you know, an absolutely immense amount of human ingenuity and probably, you know, things that are of the, uh, and we are talking of centuries of work. So, uh, and, and so we have to be very modest that in this grand journey of science that started, you know, a few centuries back, uh, this is only the beginning and there are probably entire classes of knowledge that we, we don't even uh, we, we don't even have yet the suspicion that it might even exist. So, um, yeah, I, so and I fully agree with you, Joanna. It's, it's, it's a core belief of mine, too, that, yeah. I mean, the, I, I believe it was, I don't want to get this wrong, Voltaire, who said, if it, no, no, Pascal, who said, if it exists, it can be quantified. And of course, there's limitations on our ability to do that. But I believe, ultimately, um, with sufficient capacity, everything can be quantified and understood. But obviously, the issue is we are so far away from that capacity that in practice, beginning any kind of business-based journey with that philosophy is insane because we're, we're too far away from the goal. But it's, it's an important follow-on from the idea of the forecast always being wrong and, and, and the point that Joannes made about micromanaging forecasts. What, when, when George Box said, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, and that's sort of where the forecast is always wrong has, has come from, there's two other things he said that most people ignore. The first was, since all models are wrong, but some are useful, aim for parsimony in model selection. So in other words, you're going to be wrong no matter what. So especially you uh, economists, building a huge complicated model is still going to end up with some degree of wrong. So don't predicate the need for, uh, or don't predicate your, your operational strategies on the need for a huge complex model that'll give you accuracy because you'll still be wrong. But the second, and this is to me the more, the more important one in practice, is don't sweat the mice when there's tigers around. And the number of times we work with organizations where they say they know the forecast is always wrong, their forecast accuracy in practice is abysmal, but we spend hours debating one or two percent at a horizon of seven or eight months on a skew is crazy. Your forecast accuracy at that horizon at the skew level is, for instance, 30 percent. Whether or not you adjust at one or two percent is immaterial. You're going to be wrong and you're going to be so wrong that the time you took to make that one or two percent adjustment is a complete waste of time. 
you should only be looking at applying that ultimately infinite capacity for ingenuity that I also believe humans have in specific application where the probability of upside is greatest. And that's when A, you understand something with certainty about the future that isn't reflected in history. B, that the value of the thing you're touching is sufficiently valuable to warrant the intervention. And ultimately, C, that the scale of that intervention is sufficiently large to warrant taking it. Because otherwise, you still end up inside the error margins and you've got safety stock or some other mechanism taking care of it anyway. That's very intriguing because that's, that, again reflect very much the sort of journey that uh, Lockhart went through, where um, nowadays uh, the way to approach that is first to only approach the anticipation of the future through its consequences. So that's why now it's almost like a dogmatic, you know, part of the Lockhart dogma is to say um, um, naked forecasts are not allowed. So you're not, I mean, and literally that's, we enforce, I mean, I am able to enforce it at LOCAD, obviously, being, being the CEO, but uh, the, the idea is that, um, they, that indeed, when you do a naked forecast, you very much by definition, you are insulated from the sort of real world consequences, you know, uh, the forecast in and in itself, it's, uh, it's an abstraction of a measurement for the future. It says nothing about you know, whether your business is good or bad. Yes, you, you, can, you can tweak the numbers, but ultimately, uh, ultimately, it's not even really connected to the reality. You know, it's, it's a very, very abstract uh, thing. And again, that's, people are only willing to go into this sort of exercise due to the fact that forecasting has been pretty much the classic forecasting has been almost reified. So there are, there are people that are forecasting in their resume. They, I, I, I'm certified to do forecasting. There is forecasting and demand planner is a thing. They are like you can, um, you have positions, you have processes. So, so you see this thing that was very abstract, that was one way to approach the future has been reified through job positions software components, you, you pay money for licenses to get them. So you see, again, that's a way to make it real. If you pay for something, certainly, you know, this something does exist. And, and so the approach, if I go back to this idea of naked forecast, the, the, the sort of answer that Locke had had was that, no, no, we have to treat forecasting as uh, one, um, one technique among many others, numerical technique, that just let us uh, uh, pick decisions. So that's tangible things that have a tangible impact on the business. So the idea is that um, if you don't have a direct connection to something that is very, very tangible, such as you know, producing something, moving something from place A to place B, uh, produ producing something so you get rid of some materials and you have some outcome, um, if you don't have this very, very direct link, then you're not allowed to have, I would say, a predictive modeling. Because that's, that's the thing that is very tempting, is that as soon as you have a time series, again, as soon as you have any kind of data, you can always engineer a model that provides some kind of projection. You know, again, that's, that's the beauty of it, is that uh, uh, whether it is uh, relevant, whether it is uh, wise, it is very feasible. Uh, to have those sort of things. And that's the problem is that, again, that I would say, the, when you have a, a hammer in your hand, everything looks like nails. So if, if you have a certification in forecasting techniques, then you can take any data set and start applying your models. Uh, so, so again, back our policy was no naked forecast because they are too dangerous because indeed, if you don't connect with something that is very, very real, uh, I haven't found any way to not be subject to intense, I would say, bias or, or even to, to, to be subject to um, bureaucratic, you know, bureaucratic problems where you suddenly, you, 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 you come up with a metric. So, okay, you have, you have a solution, you can have a metric, and then you can have all sorts of things within the organization to kind of, up, to, to, to do an optimization against this made up metric. And, Considering that supply chain, I believe, at, at their core, are fairly 
bureaucratic beast. You know, aligning supply, uh, supply and demand is a very bureaucratic exercise. You know, it, it's about synchronizing a lot of people, a lot of processes. So there is this kind of bureaucratic core. So that's why if you, if you add fuel to the fire, then you, you end up with, uh, with something that can very rapidly take relatively large proportion just by, because those supply chains we are talking of are just, I would say, human things that are made up of tons of people, tons of software, and tons of processes. So that's, that's I would say, a very fertile ground for, for those so, sort of problems to emerge, especially with forecasting. Well, that's the thing, Jonathan, and to throw it back to you, how exactly does a greater understanding of behavioral economics within the organization improve the forecasting? I mean, in concrete terms. To begin with, I mean, I, I would say in, in two broad ways. So there's a lot of organizations that believe that humans are not impacting the forecast process. So they've, they've often made a conscious decision to try to keep human judgment as far away from the, human, from the forecasting process as possible. Um, and, and they believe then as a result, they're, they're more immune to these, these, the biases and, and some of the overt um, gamesmanship that takes place in, in what Joannes aptly called a, a very bureaucratic process. I would argue that even in situations where we think we've kept humans away from the process, there are still human fingerprints all over it. There's human fingerprints in, in the selection of the data, in, in the selection of software, but most importantly, there's human fingerprints in the action that we take as a result of the forecasting process. I mean, the forecast is in and of itself nothing. It's an idea. It's, it's a potential set of instructions or, or a map. We still have to decide what to do with that afterwards, and that requires humans at some point in supply chain taking action to, to pull the trigger. So understanding the extent to which and the, and, and the ways in which we are biased Helps understand helps us understand with even greater insight what the what the potential pitfalls are in our process. So I forget exactly how Joanne has put it, but I liked it very much. Working backwards from the potential outcomes to the process, rather than saying this process is going to bring us to an outcome, because that outcome is very uncertain. So understanding the the, the sources of and and degrees of bias in the people in supply chain and in planning helps us understand with even greater insight what those outcomes could be. But more likely, an organization has a, a forecasting or demand planning process that has some degree of uh, automation and computer-driven uh, elements, but also has, uh, by design, the integration of human judgment. And, and I believe with subject to specific um, guidelines, there is a value over time to integration of judgment subject to specific criteria. But you help maximize the potential for having that human judgment add value if, again, you understand the extent to which the people providing that judgment have biases. It's in organizations that want to, that either actively do not want to believe they have bias or are oblivious to the fact that they do have bias, that you're most likely to be transmitting bias into the demand planning process, either through active integration of judgments or with these human fingerprints that exist everywhere else. When you begin to look at, at the biases that are in your organization, you can start to provide gar guardrails that, that mitigate their impact. It's always going to be there. I mean, human judgment is always going to be faulty. But it's a matter of balancing the potential upside of human insights in particular instances versus the certainty that with those insights is going to come the frailty that afflicts all of us because of the, the imperfection of, our, of, of how our minds work. Joannis, your thoughts? Um, I, I, I agree with the idea, which is, uh, which is also my experience, is that if you, if you don't even acknowledge the fact that you, you might have biases, it is, I would say... Uh, a, a very, uh, a, a very time-tested recipe to kind of maximize the amount of biases that you that you have. So that that I have a, a full agreement, and indeed for organization that is that is very much uh, my own experience. Uh, the the sort of things where I would say, and if I have you know to 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 deconstruct further this idea of approaching the future, um, when when people think about uh, th those biases, they still have this, 
I would say, time series perspective in mind. And again, it's, it's very difficult to uh, think about what am I doing wrong in my forecasting activity without you know, having the sort of the solution, the mechanism by which I'm doing it in mind. And, and so the bias reflects to the fact that you, you, do, you have things that are you know, too high or too low. And this is a very much you know, one dimensional perspective with the idea that you have, you know, uh, that you're, you're operating with a time series. The um, sort of problems that I've seen, uh, and that has again been the sort of technological evolution of LOCAD, is that um, if you want to convey you know, information about the future, uh, there are entire classes of things that cannot be expressed with time series. And um, it doesn't mean that it cannot be expressed with numbers. It just it cannot be expressed with time series. Time series are a very, very simplistic way. You know, it's literally a sequence of measurements that extend into the future. Just to give an example, um, if I am looking at my sales, you know, one product, I'm selling one product, that's super simple. I could, you know, forecast my sales volumes, but my sales volumes are conditional to the price I practice, and the price are not something that is a given. It's a, it's a decision for me. So even, even if I was able to have, you know, a very good forecast, very accurate forecast, it would still be something that would be kind of strange. It would have to be mathematically a function that says, if I do this for the price, then this would be um, the outcome. So, that, so here we are, we are suddenly I'm touching the fact that even if we are looking from this you know, very deterministic pers perspective you know, of just having bias and whatnot, I'm just pointing out that there are elements where this time series perspective is just um, very weak to take into account things that are very big because it's, it's not a bone, you know, it's not just about having something that is too high or too low. It is almost, it's a different di dimension, you know, that is just not accounted for. So here I'm just giving the, the idea of having, uh, of being able to literally shape the outcome by other actions. So it's not just, I'm not just like an observer, like for the movement of planets, I'm, I can act and modify the future outcome. But also, I can also give other, other, even if we stay with a purely passive observer, there are also situations where time series are still insufficient. If I go, for example, for uh, aviation maintenance, I want to keep my aircraft flying. I can forecast the, the you know, demand for parts, but the thing is that when I repair an aircraft, there is um, a list of parts that I need to repair. So an aircraft, I'm, I'm simplifying the schema. An aircraft come in in the, the hangar for maintenance. People do a diagnosis. There is a list of parts that they need to change. And until every single of those parts have been changed, um, the aircraft cannot fly again. The aircraft is grounded. Here, if the, the fact that I can forecast uh, you know, all the parts independently do not tell me anything about the joint uh, availability of all the parts. I mean, in theory, if all my forecasts were absolutely perfect for all the parts, then yes, you know, if, if for every part I have perfect knowledge, then um, the joint knowledge would be perfect as well. But as soon as you have like minute, you know, uncertainty on every part, knowing that, again, for the audience, uh, an aircraft is about, um, is the order of magnitude is about 300,000 distinct parts, even very minute uncertainty on you know, the sort of need that you have for every single part means that the sort of uncertainty that you have for the joint availability of all the parts that you need to repair the aircraft is absolutely gigantic. And that's, that is an example where, where essentially um, the sort of classic time series perspective just mathematically is just not expressive enough. So that's another class of problems where um, the, the sort of problem that we have, if we go back to biases, is that um, it's, uh, you have the sort of, of bias like um, uh, you know, forecasting too high or too low, but you have also other classes of very human problems that are just that you're not even looking in the right direction or you're not even looking with a sort of, the sort of structure that would give you an, a, a, a relevant answer. And those but those are, I would say, very much the sort of 21st century sort of way of, of looking at it. Uh, and they are 
much more puzzling, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree. Well, that then leads us, I think, tidily to discussing the future or the next <laughs> hundred years of the future of the futures. The future of the futures. So, Jonathan, I'll go first to you. I mean, in terms of AI development and technology, do you see that aiding people in forecasting or ultimately replacing them? When Daniel Kahneman gets asked about AI replacing people, um, he's on the one hand hopeful that it does because we're so bad at making objective judgments, but he's on the other hand certain that it will never happen. <laughs> um, and, 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 and again, this is to me the importance of dividing the, the theoretical or the philosophical from the practical. Um, on the theoretical side, uh, it should occur at some point in the future, at some point where our, our capacity for processing data, our capacity for understanding at a much more nuanced and granular level how human thought works and, and what intelligence itself actually is, that it will allow us to give rise to complex systems like the guys at the, at the Dartmouth conference in the 50s were aiming for when they thought they could replicate the human brain in, in a matter of a couple of decades. That's on the theoretical side. In real life, in, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, I don't believe that will happen. And, and, and I can say that with some degree of certainty just by looking at the trajectory of what we've seen over the last 70 years of AI. Certainly, we're learning a lot today. Certainly, computing processing power is expanding exponentially as is the amount of available data. But that has still not yielded anything close to the kind of breakthrough in, in AI in practice that will replace humans. Can it assist us? Certainly. Uh, I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of examples today of where the, the nascent application of AI is having a, a benefit in, in a lot of different areas. But the gap between replacing people and assisting people today remains a, a, a gaping chasm. Uh, and going back to, to something that Joanna said early on that I agree with very much is the, the human capacity for ingenuity is that piece that I, I think we're in no danger of having replaced by computers or by AI. I think the, the value of humanity is not in being able to answer complex questions because I think we can correctly put computers to use to solve complex questions. I think where we are most valuable is asking an interesting and important question in the first place. It's, it's only in posing those questions that we can bring to bear the, the sum total of technology today to, to come up with the answer. But it's, it's asking those blue sky questions that makes humans still, uh, I think, a, a critical part of the process. Joannis, I'll throw it over to you. What do you think? <laughs> so, I, my, my take is that um, what people see as forecasting, as a human activity, uh, my, I would say the classical sense, again, having you know, an army of clerks, some, somehow, I, I don't want to sound too, too pejorative in the company, but having <laughs> companies having you know, their SNOP processes um, supported by hundreds of people, uh, processing spreadsheets, etc., and, and, and generating numbers. Uh, I'm very hopeful that within my lifetime, I will be seeing it disappear. And, um, and, and the sort of practice that we have at LOCAD <laughs> make me very hopeful because at LOCAD, we have, I believe, for the clients that we serve, we have pretty much eliminated, eliminated that. But the way we've done it, and that's the sort of paradox, is that not by eliminating, I would say, people or, you know, having some kind of artificial intelligence, the, the way we, di we did it was a focus on those decisions, have smart engineers engineer numerical recipes. That's the typical term that I use because, uh, you know, that's a lot, some might be, you know, heuristic, some might be even more mundane, you know, just filter and whatnot. Even, that's not even a heuristic, that's something even more basic than that. So engineering numerical recipes that just operate um, um, at scale for those companies, the mundane daily stuff. And, and that, um, that can be, I would say, entirely automated. Now, does that mean that we have removed humans from the picture? Not, not, not really, because first, the numerical recipes are 
a very much human product. So it takes really smart human engineer to you know, uh, craft them. And, and the maintenance is also entirely human, uh, human driven. So, so literally, the numerical recipes are just you know, a sort of know-how of what sort of numerical processes works at scale to generate reasonable uh, um, decisions. Is there any intelligence in the numerical recipe itself? Absolutely not. The, the, the numerical recipe is a, a, a very, I would say, uh, mechanical affair. Yes, there might be bits of machine learning, but that's just you know statistical techniques. They are still incredibly mechanical in nature. And uh, but where it is very interesting is that if you start you know going for this perspective, what you end up is. Um, is still a process that automates away something that keeps uh, busy, you know, uh, in large companies, hundreds of, of, of people. Yet, at the end of the day, you still have, you know, a, a team of, of people who are very much, you know, in charge of those numerical recipes that don't operate themselves. And, and when I say they run automatically, the, the key sort of, of way to approach the problem is in, for, for people, humans, to be able to think, they need to have the mental bandwidth to, to do that. And if they are completely buried under, I would say, the minute details of, as you de described, you know, those super complex things where you have literally an example of super complex thing in supply chain would be I have 50 million SKUs that needs, you know, some kind of micromanagement where I need to choose whether I'm going to have like one unit in stock, two, three, five, etc. And I have 50 millions of those, you know, uh, stock levels to micromanage on a daily basis. My, my hope is that the sort of minute forecasts that, that are needed to power this sort of decision will be entirely automated in the sense of daily execution. In the sense of anything, you know, for a longer horizon, so from one year to the next, where the company itself evolves, where it's a market evolves, where the sort of what is the right question I should, uh, I should try to answer evolve. These sort of things, yeah, I, I don't think, I, I'm not very hopeful that I will see it in my lifetime, you know, to be answered through machines, you know. Um, and, um, uh, but that, that, you see, the, the take is, I think the, the problem is that uh, still for companies, that would still mean in practice, that this automation would, m is, and I, I'm, I'm very, I would say, I, I, it's something that I would believe strongly, is going to replace entire, I would say, layers of the ecosystem of uh, where there are people who are doing things that have very little added value, you know, especially in, under the umbrella of SNOP. You know, we, we can say pro or against SNOP, but I'm just saying that under the umbrella of NAP, many companies have tons of people. Some people would argue, you know, that it's maybe not the real SNOP or the good SNOP or whatever. Uh, it's not my debate. My point is I just factually observed that in this industry, supply chain, you know, um, there are a lot of large companies that have absolutely staggeringly large teams of people who are just pushing numbers up and down. And that, I suspect, might disappear, not because we have some kind of fantastical sort of tooling that would eliminate you know, the need for human, just because with better tooling and better sort of techniques, we can have a few smart people that can engineer things that operate at a very large scale. Well, if I just throw it back to Jonathan, do you have anything in response to that? Because I want to give you the last word on that. <laughs> I mean, I can have the last word, but I, I, I agree broadly with everything he's saying, for sure. And, and I won't be drawn into the SNOP debate either. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, we'll push on a little bit then. And in terms of going forward, if you were to write um, a second edition of Histories of the Future, Histories of the Future Part 2 of the 21st century, are there any specific ideas that you would focus on? No. <laughs> my, my second book will not be a sequel to this book. My second book will have to be after I'm retired, uh, because it would be a story of, of all the insane things I've seen people do in supply chain over the course of my <laughs> career, who despite all the mountains of evidence of how crazy it would be to do it, they persist in doing it anyway. Um, but obviously, uh, 
all of you current clients out there, don't worry, you won't be in it. Um, but no, I, I mean, I, I, we're only a few months after I published this book, so I don't think there's there's any of these these new, as Joanna said, as yet undiscovered um, systems of knowledge or or, or types of uh, science that that I need to start thinking about. Well, on that note, and it's it's something I didn't get a chance to ask earlier, and Joanna, I will ask you as well. In your experience at Northvine, when you're in a room with C-level executives and you're trying to sell them these ideas that you're talking about, and you you encounter that level of resistance that we talked about earlier through unconscious biases, how do you leverage behavioral economics to push through that, to, to try and avoid the kinds of insane examples you were just alluding to? Mm. I'm going to partially reject the premise of your question. Um, I, I don't think... I mean, maybe I unconsciously uh, apply knowledge of BE to, to, to navigate these sticky situations, but I don't think I, I particularly try to use BE as a way to, to come to a, a desired conclusion in these discussions. I think I, I'm, I'm in maybe a, an easier position to, to navigate that ground than, for instance, a software vendor, because for, for me business success doesn't look like selling a piece of software. And to be clear, I'm not saying software is not important. It absolutely is. It's a, it's a critical enabler. But because we're in, in the the business of assessing processes and, and issues and ultimately architecting solutions, I'm not often in the position of trying to push C-suite folks towards a certain direction. It's, it's more an understanding of, given the culture of, of their business, given their available resources, be they data, tools, people, where is the, where is the most likely or most optimal first step on the journey towards process transformation? Um, and if they're, if they're strongly against the idea of I don't know, re relinquishing their grip on a forecast and, and they really want to have 300 salespeople spend time every month adjusting a forecast, that's not necessarily a hill for me to die on. I mean, it's then, okay, if, if this is, continues to be your reality, let's have that as part of the process. But importantly, let's measure the business value of that activity. And, and they'll often come to the conclusion themselves. The, the reason that a lot of these crazy activities exist is because the legacy in these organizations is some sort of a measurement that allows them to persist. It's, it's a measurement that doesn't make obvious how crazy the, the activity is. It, the, the measures themselves are often crazy because it requires a crazy measure to, to substantiate a crazy process. But when you go to an organization and see the measuring accuracy at, at, at the top level dollar value and averaged across three months, you know that is the product of them not wanting to know how bad the forecast process is. Because if they were using it for its in intended purpose, which is diagnostic rather than scorecard, you would never aggregate multiple months and you would never aggregate that high in a, in a hierarchy. But I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but the, the bottom line is I'm not trying to push them to a conclusion. If they're, if they're really hung up on a crazy process, we just help them understand by measuring the business benefit of that crazy process, whether or not they want to continue to do it. And, and, and often they'll come to the conclusion themselves. Yeah, I mean, I always look at being in the shoes of a software vendor. My approach is usually uh, quite different. But, uh, and, uh, and my approach usually is to outline s s examples as simple as I can make them where um, the sort of forecast just cannot deliver what they are looking for. And, and, uh, and sometimes it is, um, uh, I mean, sometimes and very frequently, there are very, there are very simple situations. So, you know, in aviation, I just described, you if, you if you do things at the part level, that still gives you zero information about whether you're going to repair the aircraft. Um, if you go into retails and you say and you just assess that the store has tons of products that have that are very good substitute from one another, you, you, you have other class of problems where you see, well, it's it's not going to give me a, a good indicator. Then am I very successful with this sort of organization? I don't know. I, and, and and maybe you know your own approach, which have to have them do their own journey 
might be you know more more efficient you know it's uh, uh, it's um, it's a difficult journey one of these sort of of point that that makes the, the local experience interesting not necessarily easier but interesting is that by focusing on the decisions the sort of things that we are doing in terms of predictive modeling are just very very strange you know positively and that's uh, and um, and so there, there is this journey that I see where um, the sort of forecasts that are most useful are, um, are getting stranger and stranger. And I suspect, you know, we don't have the book of, for the 21st century of, yet for Not those yet. histories of the future. But uh, if I had one take on that, would be that those, the 21st century histories of the future is going to be very, very strange. A bit the sort of strangeness that arise with quantum mechanics, you know, it's, it is at a, at a level, it's just a whole set of ideas that are just absolutely not intuitive. They come with math that are just bizarre. Um, when you sort of apply that, you end up with even more bizarre things, and etc. Et we will see, you know, it's not a, you're just, just a, an outcome, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I see emerging. Well, gentlemen, I think I might bring this to a close, but before we go, Jonathan, if you had one piece of advice to give everyone in supply chain management or any supply chain practitioners out there, what would it be? Buy the book. Buy the book. <laughs> Available in stores. Uh, yeah, that's, that's advice that maybe my accountant would give. Um, if it's a single piece of advice, it's ask why. Mm -hmm. ne never be satisfied with just knowing. Try to understand why. We actually have a very nice quote, and I don't know, there's no attribution, I don't know if you wrote it, but it was a, a a bad forecaster is like uh, a bad forecaster is like with data is like a, a drunk with a lamppost. Yeah, he uses it uh, for support <laughs> rather than illumination. Yes. So always look for the light. Yeah. All thank right. you very much. Well, Jonathan, thank you very much for your time. Uh, join us. Thank you for yours, and thank you all for watching. We'll see you all next time.